Well, good morning. Let's open our Bibles to Psalm 99. Psalm 99. There, we were been looking at the royal psalms. We started in 93. The Lord reigns. The stress is the Lord reigns and he alone reigns. And then in Psalm 94, it's followed by, if the Lord's reigning, why do we see so much trouble and turmoil on the earth? And Psalm 94 gave us, we saw Wednesday when we were together, it gives us the fact that God is doing things in the midst of the turmoil. And uh, that gives us uh, an anchor for our faith. And as you move through these psalms, loyal, the royal psalms starting in 93 to 100, you'll see that there is a common, the Lord reigns, the Lord's on the throne, let's praise Him. The Lord reigns, let's worship. The Lord reigns, let's sing. There should always be a proper response to God when God is revealing himself. We don't do that. We kind of sit stoically and God will teach us through his word and we might have a little inner, inner stirring and then we'll go home, but they actually had great emotional response to who God is. In Psalm 93, he's focusing on the acts of God. He established the world. And so now in Psalm 99, he is going to get to the highest point. Each one of these as they move are almost like the Psalms of Ascent or the Psalms of Degree, uh, 120 through 136, as they go like steps coming up and moving higher. Well, the highest point that he gets is in 99 and 100 because he's seeing God for who he is and just seeing God for who he is. And that's the highest goal of man. God created man to know him and to worship him and to fellowship with him. And he made him in his image that to do that. And that's when we function at our highest. You know, we live in a world that's looking for satisfaction and contentment. It doesn't come from the abundance of things. In Luke 12, the Lord says, life does not consist of the abundance of things. But it's this, being rich towards God. In other words, how much do we enjoy God? How much do we know God? Are we growing in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus? And that's where the contentment comes from. We're functioning the way God contended us to function. And so in Psalm 99, he is going to talk about the Lord reigning. And we'll read that in a second. And then in 100, he'll say, make a joyful noise to the Lord. And he's at a pinnacle. Now, as we read through Psalm 99, see if you can't see things that stand out to you. The Lord reigns, let the people tremble. He sits between the cherubims, let the earth stagger or be moved. The Lord is great in Zion. He is high above all the people. Let them praise thy great and terrible name, for it is holy. The king's strength also loveth judgment. Thou, doest, thou dost establish equity. Thou executest judgment and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt ye the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool, for he is holy. Moses and Aaron among his priests, and Samuel among them that call upon his name. They call upon the Lord, and he answered them. He spake unto them in the cloudy pillar. They kept his testimonies and the ordinances that he gave them. Thou answerest them, O Lord our God. Thou wast a God that forgavest them, though thou tookest vengeance upon their inventions, it says in the King James, or wrongdoings. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. Did you notice a repetition of words there? Holy, holy, holy. 
He sees the Lord for who He is. The Lord isn't just some trivial being who's a little different than us, who we should just give a little bit more time or a little more attention or, or use bigger names. No, He is holy. He's marked out as the, as the heavens are higher than the earth. He is holy. He's unique. It is the sum total of all He is that makes Him horizoned off, different. And He says three times, holy, holy. Actually, it's four times because He calls His hill in verse 9, exalt the Lord our God and worship at His holy hill for the Lord our God is holy. Do you realize wherever the Lord's presence is, is made holy? You think that sand under Moses' feet in Exodus 3 was any different than the sand on the other side where his feet weren't? The whole point is the presence of the Lord was in the burning bush, and that made the, the, the sand holy. And when we, even Corinthians, who are walking as mere men, have the indwelling Spirit of God, they are called in chapter 1, holy saints. Think about it. The privilege of being called that, having the presence of God, because it makes us holy, set apart, different. Can I challenge you? Because I'm leaving, I can do that. Are you holy? Are you different? You see, as we read this, the one of the things that's going to, when you read these Psalms, just like the Psalms of Ascent, there's a progression because every time there's life, whether it's spiritual or biological, there should be progression. There should be increase. Children don't stay in diapers and have to be picked up all the, their whole life. They go to being crawlers and then walkers and fallers and then walkers and runners and then they become walkers, and then we go back to being fallers and crawlers. That's the cycle of life. And, and I say that, and I break it up with laughter, because we really have to examine ourselves. I'm not here to examine you, and you're not here to examine me. We've come to hear the Lord Himself and to be challenged by Him. There should be progression in our spiritual walk and in our understanding of who God is. He's given us His Word to know Him. It's called the Word of Truth. He's given us His Spirit to know Him. He's called the Spirit of Truth. And Jesus is called the Truth, the Way, the Way, the Truth, and the Life. So we have a person to embrace when we want to embrace the truth. Think about it. And God is saying that we can progress spiritually and it all is what God desires from us as men and women who are Christians. So what should be the response? Well, the highest response is in Psalm 100, because notice the change. Make it joyful unto the Lord, all ye lands. Now, I must stop for a moment and say something. So if you're visiting, you might not get the, the, the wrong idea. Th these Psalms, 150 of them, I think 136 have God's name, or some name or title of God in the first verse. And 116 of them have a historical reference or a superscription where you can get an idea of what he's going to talk about or where did it come from. But one of the things that we need to understand is that these were songs that were sung. And they were, saw, they were sung joyfully. Now, the thing that I want to clarify, though, for the visitors is this. When you look at these royal songs, they have a future aspect and total fulfillment and application when the Lord comes and reigns on His throne on the earth. There will be righteousness on a throne. There will be holiness on the earth reigning from out of where the Lord is. But it's also a, an application to the psalmist when he was writing for his day and age. But there are principles here about God who never changes. And if he does, we can take it and apply it to ourselves because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. And that's why he's trustworthy. We change. 
And so we really sometimes aren't trustworthy. Sometimes it's not because of our character. Sometimes it's because of our biological makeup. We can't remember what we promised or what we remember where we were supposed to be. But God never changes. God never, never changes. So make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. I believe he's looking forward to that time when, when the Lord will reign on the earth. But, listen, it's an invitation to anyone, even today, no matter what your nationality is, to come and to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. You can't say, well, uh, I'm not uh, from Israel, or I, I don't live in Palestine, or whatever. You, you have to say, well, God's inviting. Do you remember Abraham? Abraham was to be the source of blessing for all the nations of the earth, not just for Israel. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His countenance with singing. Now, I want to stop again. I said this last week. I want to say it again for those that weren't here. I believe verses like this one challenge me. Am I really serving the Lord? Do we really serve the Lord properly? if it's not with gladness. Well, I'll do it if they tell me. I can't believe He wants me to do it. Is that serving the Lord? Is it really? You know, one Psalm 118, we sing it all the time. How are you today? Well, this is the day that the Lord hath made. We'll be glad and rejoice in it. Do you know that song was sung by the Lord on the way to the cross? That was the one crossing the Brookhedron. He was saying, I'm going to the cross, but this is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice. Can you serve the Lord under the worst circumstances, being nailed to a cross and still be glad? Yes! And that's why we need to see the Lord reigning on the throne, high above all the nations of the earth, high above any of the waters that are splashing us down here, knocking us around, and we get them. And we have our down moments, and we have our moments of confusion. But listen, when we can fix and make a joyful noise on the, uh, because of who the Lord is, and we see Him, we can serve the Lord with gladness. We can come before His presence with singing. We know that the Lord, He is God. It is He that made us, and we not ourselves. We are the pe His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name because for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endures for all generations. Now you can tell we're not going to go verse by verse and exegete these two Psalms. We just can't do that. I'd have to do one at a time. But I want to pull out the flow of it at least, and see what he is talking about and what's, what's occupying his mind, what the Spirit of God would have us be occupied with. And Psalm 99, I believe, is so important because he sees the Lord for who he is. He's, this is the highest step, seeing the Lord. Number one, look at verse 99, and let's pull just some things out. Number one, the Lord reigns. You realize that? I know it seems chaotic in your life. We did that in Psalm 94. The explanation is there. In amongst the chaos, God is doing certain things. He is judging nations. He is purifying His people. He is, doing, he is accomplishing. He uses the wickedness of men and the chaos of a sinful earth to accomplish His purposes in human history. And the ultimate one, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, is that his people suffer so that in the day that unbelievers are judged, it says it will be a righteous recompense when God judges them by the way that they treat you. We always talk about, well, we got to see everybody saved. That's a good thing. Uh, but, you know, Ezekiel didn't see that. Isaiah didn't see that. Many of us don't see that all the time. But listen, the way you're treated shows that the people who are treating you, what they're made out of. Do you realize that? 
Did you ever say, Lord, thank you that that person got me fired? Because he did it just because he hates you. And now you can judge him righteously because he manifested or she manifested herself to everyone. Now, that's not to say we don't pray that they get saved. We don't want everybody, oh, well, you're going to go into judgment. Aha, uh-huh, because you... No, we want people to be saved, but realize this, everything happens to you as a believer for a reason. Do you understand that? The big one, listen to this, see if you can relate to this. Why is God allowing this to happen to me? What is he trying to accomplish in my life? If you're a believer, there's only one thing he's really going to do in everything in your life. You know what it is? Reveal himself to you. My mom, she had four strokes. She died, I realized this morning, 19 years ago today, because it's the day after my son's birthday. It was yesterday. She died after his birthday. But for 12 months, she laid in Fort Lauderdale in a stroke rehabilitation center, and she couldn't move anything but her eyes. Mom, if you hear me, move your eyes. She, when she first got there, she could squeeze our hands, and it was kind of pitiful. But when I get there and I walk in and I see her in that shape, can you imagine? Here's the traditional Christian thing. Well, Mom, God left you here on earth because he has something for you to do. You're kidding me. It's not make the bed. It's not get out of bed and wash the floor. You can't say that. I say, Mom, I know that you're here and God's left you here because there are things in your condition you can learn about the Lord that you couldn't learn when you could walk. True? Can you glorify the Lord in that condition? Yes. If you're wrongfully mistreated and put in prison, can you glorify the Lord? Yes. If you lose your job because you have an atheistic person there and they just want to cause trouble, can you glorify him? Yes. In all things, you can glorify the Lord. We're told that whatsoever we do, even eating and drinking, do all to the glory of God. I like that one. I can eat to the glory of God. <laughs> I believe that one. But do you understand what we're saying? The Lord God reigns. Let's get a little smile and let's realize, thank you, Lord. You know why? Because he's going to talk about who the Lord is in Psalm 99. Let's see in a few moments. Let's just take a few moments and look about what he realizes who this one reigning is. Number one, he dwells between the cherubims. Let all the earth stagger, tremble. You know what it means to dwell between the cherubims? The cherubims that were on the mercy seat were nothing more than a throne. And in Exodus 25 and 26, when the Lord tells them to make them, He tells them that I will dwell there, He will sit there, dwell there, and He will lead, guide, and rule His people. And He dwells amongst, listen, the Lord, doesn't that remind you of Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 2, when He saw the wheel within a wheel, and He he sees this, this throne on a, uh, on a chariot, and there's a throne and a firmament, and the one sitting on the throne was like unto the Son of Man. That's so marvelous. That's before the Son of Man came, and they had a likeness of the Son of Man with the cherubims taking that, pulling that chariot of God. Or every place the glory of God went, those cherubim took the glory of God. He dwells between, above, and among all spiritual beings. There's no spiritual being that doesn't answer to God. You say, well, what about Satan? In Job, when he calls the sons of God into his presence, guess who who has to go there? Satan. And when he goes into the lake of fire, you think there's going to be a fight? He's just going to say, now you go into that lake of fire. Go, and you'll go. Does that make you feel a little more at ease in this world? Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world? Yes. Yes. He dwells between the cherubim. Let the earth stagger. Let the people tremble. He rules and he guides. He's in control. And then look at verses 2 and 3. The Lord is, underline it, 
great in Zion. He is high above all the people. Let them praise thy great and terrible name because it is holy. Now let me ask you a question. How great is the Lord above the people of the earth? Oh, he's at least a foot over me. He's infinitely above all. His attribute, he's infinite. I mean, so he's above all, he rules all, he's great. Number, f the fourth point is this, he's holy. It says his name is terrible for it is holy. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your heavenly, that means holy Father. Oh, we need to understand who our God is better than we do and stop moping and groping and falling apart in Bambi Pim. I'm just giving you my autobiography. Don't think that I'm some kind of gigantic saint who doesn't have his worries and, and things like that. I mean, we all do. They just pop up and it says, be anxious for nothing. But I'm glad it says, and cast your care upon him, the same anxious word, because they pop up when you're old like this. I worry about not even having a thing to worry about. I mean, it's just the way it is when you get older. I wake up at five in the morning in my bed and I'm thinking, well, what if this and what about that? And I can't believe this. And But listen, then I think, wait a second. Lord, you're above all. You're overall, and the fact that you're holy means you'll do what's right. We have this promise, John says, that if we ask anything according to his will, watch now, it doesn't say he'll answer, it says he hears us. You know why that's great? Because a holy person who hears your need will do what's right. You know the best illustration of that? Mary and Martha, John chapter 11. They simply say to the Lord, here's what we would have done. Uh, Lord, uh, Lazarus is sick and you better um, heal him where you are or do something for him and we'll tell you the best way to do it. Don't, you don't have to come, but just speak the word because we don't want to cause a ruckus here. And We'll give them all the details. It's sim they simply said, him whom thou lovest is sick. Give it to God. Pray that way. Lord, I have this problem. You love me. I give it to you. It's over with. You do it. He'll do what's right because he's holy. Look at verse 4. The king's strength also loves judgment. Thou, doest, thou dost establish equality, equity, fairness. You execute judgment. That's discernment and righteousness. And listen, next to that, you can write, he always does right. And here's the kicker, in Jacob. You think it's an accident that the Spirit of God didn't say Israel? Whenever God wants to stress something, he puts in Jacob to them. Because Jacob was the supplanter. He had to have his name and his character changed. He had to have a new name and a new walk, even though it was with a limp. Because he had to realize he didn't deserve anything. It was by the grace of God. I will not let you go unless you bless me. Tell me your name. You lied to me one time before. You said it was Esau. What's your name now? And with his own lips, asking for a blessing, he'd have to say in Hebrew, uh, I'm the supplanter. I'm the schemer. I'm the liar. Now I can bless you. And that's so wonderful. If he can, here's the good point. If he does just and right in Jacob, the, the, uh, the one who's a schemer, will he do it in your life? Yes, he will. I don't know if think my lips move that time. I'm getting better at my ventriloquism. Of course he will. That's why he uses the greater to get you on the lesser. So you'll understand if he does it to that schemer Jacob, would that we now stopped and had a whole message on how he worked in Jacob's life all the way through to get him where he was. And then Jacob walked with a limp. I love that verse in Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 11, when it said when, when, um, when uh, Jacob came to the end of his life, it says he worshipped God, listen, leaning on his staff. 
You know what he was saying? Jacob never ever despised what God did to him in halting him because he learned a great principle. I don't do, deserve anything, but yet God has brought me to the end of my life and I thank God for it. Isn't that wonderful? You know, God's going to be faithful to you. I know I sound like a contemporary preacher and everything's going to be fine and you'll be rich. And I'm not saying that. I'm saying you have, a, you have a relationship with a faithful, holy God who's above all and over all and he's ruling. And he is the one who you commit your life to. You confess Jesus as Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. And now you who are not a people are now the people of God. Are you glad to be a people of God, a child of the king? A child of God. Well, he's not going to treat you like a stepchild now. He gave his son. Uh, here's Abraham, Genesis 22. Take now thy son, thy only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and go to the place that I will tell you and offer him there. Do you think Jesus would die for you and the father would plan to send his son to die for you and then leave you flounder around on a curb? No. He's reigning, and he wants you to respond to that. And so it says in verse 5, here comes the result. Exalt ye the Lord our God, and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. You know how to worship at a footstool? Down below it where it is. We don't do that much. But you get something serious, and you're at home praying for it, you'll find yourself on the floor sometimes, won't you? Oh, God. People say, well, what's, what, how should we pray? Depends on your burden. You can go through the Bible and find different positions, and it all depends on the burden. Are you happy? Stand, put your hands, and it's the Lord, thank you. I walk around my house sometimes when I'm done, done studying, and my wife isn't there, so she can't think I'm going crazy. And I'll pray for the house, and I'll pray that it will be used in the Bible study, and uh, on Sunday night, we have a Bible study once a month there, and and, I, and I'll pray for things, and there are times when I get on my knees in the morning on my couch and I pray, and there are times when I just sit at my desk and pray. But the fact of the matter is, you worship at his footstool. Now, here's the problem, and I have, this is what I have to stress this morning, because right now, the normal tendency for us would be to, whoa, and back away and say, man, if he is holy, three times holy, 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 and if his hill is holy, and his name is holy, and he is above all and over all, I, 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 would, I, I just want to run. And there are people, Christians, I remember one time when I was newly saved, I read First John, and I said, I must not be saved. I threw my New Testament over the, uh, the, the, the side of my bed. I said, I must not be saved. He that is born of God, that which is born of God does not commit sin. <laughs> Okay, I'm done. I'm not really saved. There are times when God reveals himself to you, isn't it? When he reveals himself to us, that our tendency is, oh, then I better back away here. I don't know. This is too much for me. And God doesn't want you to do that. He wants you to draw nigh unto him. So look what he does in verses 6 through 9 of this wonderful, wonderful psalm. He says, don't go away. Listen, Moses and Aaron were among the priests, Samuel among them that called upon his name. They called upon the Lord and he answered them. Don't you love that? You know, Moses, he had problems in his walk with the Lord, didn't he? Didn't he? He forfeited going into the land because he did something. He smote the rock when he was supposed to speak to it. And he used the personal pronoun we. Shall we put up with you? Please, Moses, get down. You're not in the, it would be the quadinity. Well, how do you say four? Trinity and then the quadrant? Or, I don't know. But, but he, he was a rascal at times. And look at Aaron. Oh, Aaron, yes, the, the great high priest, the great, great, great man. Yep, made a golden calf and the people worshipped in immorality. And then when he was confronted, he said, it just jumped out of the fire. <laughs> Don't your kids say funny things to you sometimes? Why'd you do that? Well, I wasn't thinking. Good, you do, you're like a rock. They don't think 24 hours a day. So, I mean, it, it, God is simply saying, don't draw away. 
He wants, he had relationships with others who weren't perfect. Moses, Aaron, Samuel, the, with them that call upon the name of the Lord. He answered them. Beloved, don't think you're so insignificant. God isn't going to have a relationship with you. That God isn't going to answer your prayer. That God isn't going to talk to you and teach you and guide you. There's no insignificant person. Listen, if God only had a relationship with perfect people, it would just be Him and His Son again. And that would be the end of it. There's no perfect people apart from being in Christ. And one day we will be perfected. That's what we're looking for, isn't it? Thou answered them, O Lord. Look at verse 8. Our God, thou wast the God that forgave them. Though, here we go, you took a vengeance, it's really you avenged, of their wrongdoings. That is the most wonderful verse for grace and government. You know what it's meant by that? God in His grace forgives you. But you still, in the government of God, have to bear the results of your, your wrongdoings. Now, if I got down from here, and um, who do I want to pick on this morning? Walter. Not, no, Walter Land. Have to be careful. And I walk to the back, and I shoot him. And Melanie says, oh, I know you, Jonathan. You didn't mean to do it. I forgive you. I still have to bear. I still have to bear the government of what has been done. And I don't mean the American government. I mean the soul that sinneth, it dies, I know. But you sow and you reap and you have to do it. So the, the friend of mine, I had a young man. He's a fr my friend now because he's a, he's a young man. But I coached him in the pole vault in Danville. And he broke the school record. He's from the project. He never knew his dad. He only lived with his mom. He was a B student. He never was in trouble. And uh, I had him going to a MEAC school on a full scholarship. And he decided not to go because he said, Coach, I'm just from the projects and that's all I'll ever be. He was hooked into slavery of mind to that situation. And uh, he didn't go. And then he got in trouble with two other guys. And he got, he got arrested and uh, something very silly. Very, 53 years. 53 years. And I could tell him, look, I forgive you, because he asked me to forgive him. But I can't do anything for the government part of it. You sow, you reap. A young man takes advantage of it, a young girl when they're in a relationship and they're not married and they have a baby. Guess what? God forgives, but then you do from that point on what's right in that relationship and with that baby and you. I mean, I can think of a hundred illustrations. God forgives, but He doesn't just wave a magic wand. Right? Am I losing you? I hope not, because there's a hundred applications there. And what He's simply saying is this, God answered them because God forgives them. If God didn't forgive us, 1 John, we wouldn't be anywhere spiritually. For we know this, that God is light and in Him it is no darkness at all. So then they come along and say, well, that's because and blah, blah, blah. We never sinned or we don't sin and we do all these things. No, it's because God made a provision in Christ. That's 1 John chapter 1. Because He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is propitiation not only for our sin, but the sin of the world. So God can forgive but sign of repentance is you say, I, I was telling you about Earl, I'm sorry. I strayed on a senior moment. As I get older now, I have to have my wife sit up closer where I can see her because she'll go, no, 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 go back, go back, you forgot. Now, Earl never had time. He was in all of my Bible studies from 10th grade, 11th and 12th grade. Didn't have time for it. But he went to, to, to prison and he got out for 11 years. 11 years, got, didn't have to do 53. He got saved, sent us a letter the first month he was in there. Sorry for the pain I caused you. The Lord's with me now. I gave my life to the Lord and 
And you know what? If he doesn't get me out early, I'm fine. I deserve to be here. I did it. I'm just forgiven, and I know when I die, I'll be with the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? It wasn't, oh, I'm saved now. Let me out. I'm a change. No, no, not him. No. And he has his own business now, and he has a wife and a child now, and he's doing great things, you know. And one time we were in Nassau, I'm going to boast a little bit, and uh, we had the hurricane land right over and stop right over Danville, Virginia. And we got 16 inches of rain in 24 hours. And it flooded my whole front street in one portion, lifted up and went down the road. It was amazing. And um, we, we got word that our power was out. And four days later, my, my daughter-in-law says, hey, hey, Pop, you got power, but now your, your well pump doesn't work, so you don't have water. So I call Earl, and I say, Earl, Mom doesn't have any water at the house, and we're going to be home in three days. He said, I'll take care of it. I'll go underneath, crawl space in the mud, flooded. And he said, I said, oh, man, I don't want you to do that. He said, beats being in prison. And that's his attitude. He's not bitter towards God. He's not angry at God because God didn't spare him from prison. He realized, I did it. I deserve it. Listen, you answered them, Lord. You forgave them, but they had to deal with their wrongdoings. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at His holy hill. And now He's going to talk to us about how to worship. You want to hear great? Psalm 100 is so wonderful. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. I love that verse. You know why? None of us have an excuse not to partake in songs just because we can't sing. It says make a joyful noise. Right? Now, to me, and I'm sorry, contemporary music is a joyful noise. But it's changing into an unjoyful noise because my boys on the track team, man, they'd sing, they're angry. I'm like, what's wrong with you? I mean, I could have sing, Mama said, knock you out. That's how old though. It's been a long time since I've ever done. But the fact of the matter is, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, O ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Why? Now watch. Know ye that the Lord, number one, is God. Two, He is our Creator. He has made us. Three, we are the people of His... We are his people, for, and we are the sheep of his pasture. Isn't that wonderful? The one phrase I left out is this. It says, he hath made us, and not we ourselves. Underline it, circle it. Some of you young believers, you get saved and you think, how am I ever going to be like that person? How am I ever going to be all the Bible tells me to be? I can't do it. You're not going to do it. God's going to do it. He created without me, and He recreates you when you're saved. With, I mean, it, this is just an amazing point. He created, and not we ourselves. Like God has to take us out of the picture because we'll say, well, I think God should have did this on the second day instead of the first day. and He should have done this. Isn't it wonderful He didn't make man until the last day, the sixth day? <laughs> Woo! Would have been a problem. And then after he made the woman and gave him back to Adam, whew, but then he would have had a problem because he would have had my opinion and my wife's opinion, and it would all be a mess. Listen, God is a creator God. You might not like that, but he is. The law of biogenesis tells me that life begets life. Nothing never begets anything. Nothing. Nothing that has a purpose ever is payment to being without an engineer. That's why there's intelligent design, because everything's intelligent. I saw something on Facebook the other day, so it has to be true. Um, I like saying that, because today young people say, yeah, that's right. It was an article, there's a, play, there's a place I follow, and I'm not saying you should follow this, but it said, um, it's called The Creation or Creation. And he put on pictures from this microscope, this subatomic microscope of machines in the human body. 
Literal machines, when you look at it, I thought, no, that's, that's a machine. Things spinning and turning and doing this because they're moving things from here to there and they're moving things from there to here. And, and I'm like, man, oh man, how could that have happened out of nothing? How does a lump of clay become something alive with intelligent design? It had an intelligent designer. Listen, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. He is our creator. And verse 4 says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Now, I'm going to end with this because it's very important. Why would sheep ever want to go into his courts and into his presence? Hmm? What happened to sheep when they went into his court and into his presence? They became barbecue. They were sacrificed. And what he is saying now is enter into his gates with thanksgiving. This is sacrifice and courts with praise. Be thankful and bless his name. Because that was the place, the, that was the place of sacrifice and surrender. And he's saying you cannot really come in and surrender and sacrifice to the Lord. And he's telling them and using the Old Testament illustration until you realize who God is to you. Get into Psalm 99. Go to one, Psalm 100. See all the things. He is your God. He is your creator. We are his people. We are his sheep. That means he's our shepherd. I recently started on my Thursday night Bible study on uh, Facebook Live. I, I started doing a couple of things. One is I started doing small portions of Scripture. I did Psalm 23 um, and another Psalm. Uh, I did the, the Lord's Prayer because there are things that we say and we use and even unsaved people do and they don't even take time to listen to it, right? Like when I coached girls basketball for 20 years at uh, our high school, um, my wife and I, and before every game, they get together. Now, let's pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And they get done. They say, now let's go rip their heads off and let's win and let's do this, you know. And I'm like, they say this prayer and they don't know it. So I did a whole thing on, listen to this, the Lord is my shepherd. This is what we do. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know what they would have done? The Lord is my shepherd. He's my shepherd. He, that means he leads me. He guides me. He'll feed me. He'll protect me. The Lord. So listen, is it great to have the Lord as your shepherd and be his sheep? Yes. He knows the beginning from the end. He can lead you. He knows the dangers in the way. He can avoid you can make you avoid it. But we do so uh, take time when you read the scriptures. Think about it. Meditate on it. Ask questions to the Lord. What does this mean? Listen. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. He reigns. He's holy, holy, holy. And he says, now come before me. Come before into my presence. I wanted to go into Hebrews chapter 10 because there we're exhorted to go boldly. That doesn't mean rudely. It means confidently into his place, into the holy of holies because there's a new and a living way. Listen, I don't care how rough it is on earth. I don't care, and I know you have problems, because I do too, and they shake me for a while. And we get our rudder straight, and we get keep going. But you know, the best illustration is in Revelation. Before the seals start popping and the day of the Lord starts going with judgment, and then the vials and the trumps and all the other things. God says, John, I want you to see something. There's a throne in heaven. It's set. It's set on a crystal sea. God is saying, I don't care how the waves are going down there and how the froth is taking place in the nations against nations and this and that. Up here, Things are just fine. And I'll ask you as I close what I asked Wednesday night. 
Do you think God is surprised by what's troubling you today if something's troubling you? Do you think that he's up there going, oh, what do I do now? No. No. He's on a throne and he reigns and he bids you to come and to know him and to allow that to usher a response of praise and worship to him. Let's pray. Our Father, we ask to forgive us because we don't fully appreciate at times who you are. We're so frail and so earthbound. We're so influenced by time and space and material and circumstances and material blessings. And we just, we just ask that you would forgive us. And Father, help us to know you better. You've given us the written word of God. And then you gave us the living word of God, the bread from heaven, the Lord Jesus. Whom to know is life eternal. Father, I pray for the people listening to my voice here. I don't know what they're going through. But Father, may we look off onto the throne. Let the earth tremble. Let the nations quake, but we draw nigh with a full assurance because you are our God, you are our Redeemer, you are our Shepherd, our Rock, my, our High Tower, and it's all because of the Lord Jesus. Help us to live like Him. And so we thank you, Father, for speaking to our hearts this morning. We live in perilous, troubled times. May the peace of God give us great understanding and stability. The Lord said, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. We thank you for him overcoming. Father, thank you for this time together, and thank you for reminding us from your word that you reign, you're above all and over all. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.